We have two kids, Michaela and Addison. Michaela and Addison love church. When it's time for church, I'm kind of, I'm excited to go play with my friends there and learn more about God. My favorite thing is to sit by my friends and watch a video and sometimes sit with my dad. So one Sunday morning, I was teaching Kid Max three to five, and we were talking about the big idea of loving your enemies. And this is where Michaela threw up her hand, and she immediately started talking about the struggle she's having at school with a girl bullying her. We talked, you know, maybe, you know, not play with this person, but don't be mean to them at all. But she really wanted to be friends with this little girl. And then one day she turned to me and she said, Mom, can I bring a Bible to school? And I looked at her, I'm like, well, okay, I'd never do that. So she did, and I actually talked to her teacher when I was picking her up. And I said, you know, she brought a Bible to school, I'm not sure. She goes, she brought it into class and was sitting reading the Bible with this girl who was picking on her. And they were both sitting there and were so interested in it. And she's sharing the word of Jesus with her friend who was picking on everybody. She just talks about it. She, she acts it out in her everyday life. As a parent, being Christians, you couldn't want more to see your child just absolutely uh, bleed God in every part of their life. And I think that speaks volumes to the teachings of Christ through the Meeting House curriculum. Well, hello. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at the Meeting House. It is so good to be together today. And wow, what a story we just heard um, about Michaela and Addison, that how we respond to bullies, how we love others and show the love of Jesus to me is just so, um, so appropriate for this morning. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for being here. I know that there are many places that you could be, things you could be doing, and you have chosen to be here with us today. I know that sometimes that's a hard step. Sometimes that's a difficult decision to make. So I just want to say, way to go. Thanks for being here. Um, you are in the right place. I'm excited for what God's got uh, in store for us today as we spend time together. Um, in this service. Okay, one thing I want to tell you about that I'm really, really excited about. This past weekend, something called the coldest night of the year happened. It is a nationwide walk that raises money for those who are hungry, those who are homeless, and those who are hurting. And we had a number of people in our parishes across the meeting house take place in this walk this weekend. You can see the images there on your screen. And these uh, teams, these people who walked, raised nearly $20,000 for our local compassion partners across the board at the Meeting House. I think this is so exciting. This is something worth celebrating. This is a fun to be us moment. This is um, something that I think um, we can all rally around. So I just want to say way to go uh, to those of you who participated in the coldest night of the year walk. It is cold. We're here in Canada. I'm not sure where you are watching this, but we are here in Canada where it is actually cold. And so this is a super exciting thing. Um, way to go teams. I just want to encourage you uh, about that. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, today, and you have probably seen this in the news, is um, about the invasion of Ukraine this week. This is something that um, has been all over the news, all over the world. You have likely seen the many heartbreaking images that have come out of this. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, well, there are a few reasons, but the connection that we have here at the Meeting House is that we are a part of a denomination called the Brethren in Christ. And the Brethren in Christ is a part of a wider family called uh, Anabaptists. And we are Anabaptists. And there are things that make us uh, unique. There are things that stand out about us uh, things like focus on community, things like uh, focus on simplicity, um, our, our, our passivism, our stance on peace in conflict, in times of conflict. Uh, and we as Anabaptists um, 
have had a history of um, being refugees. We have lived in certain areas of the world where we've been oppressed by different uh, people, by different governments. We've been impacted by conflict ourselves. And in those times, we've actually been invited into those spaces, into Ukraine, into Russia, in different countries in that region. And so this is a part of who we are. In fact, that time in our history as Anabaptists have shaped a lot of the the customs, a lot of the things we eat, a lot of the things that we do um, as Anabaptists, particularly Mennonites, but we are family together. And so I just want to, um, yeah, acknowledge that, recognize that, that this is, uh, this is meaningful for us as all conflict is. And I know that uh, this current war is the uh, most recent and seems to have the attention of the news around the world, but there are other conflicts happening right now, whether it's Afghanistan or Ethiopia or other places that are experiencing the devastation of war. And so I want to call us to pray for peace, to pray for peace in Ukraine and all these other places that are uh, at war. We serve a God of peace. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is on the side of the widow and of the orphan and of the broken And that is the side that we are called to be on. And so I want to invite you to pray with me uh, today, to pray for peace, to pray for those who are hurting as a result of these wars that are happening. Before we do that, I just want to read from, from Psalm 46, and then I want to invite you to pray with me. Oh, and I just love this. He makes wars cease. To the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That is our hope, people. That is the God we serve the God who will make wars cease, who will bring peace, who brings peace, who comforts. And that is our calling as well. So will you pray with me this morning? God, we come to you as we are. Lord, um, as we pray together, we recognize that um, there are people all around this world who are experiencing real pain, devastation as a result of conflict, whether it's civil war or a conflict as a result of war from others. Lord, there is brokenness that is felt. There is pain. There is grieving. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would come and comfort those who are hurting, that you would draw near uh, to those who are impacted by this devastation. God, we pray for your peace in Ukraine We pray that your Holy Spirit would draw near to those who are hurting. We pray for those in leadership in that region that you would would help them end this. Lord, that you could draw them away from this direction. Lord, we know that you are a God of peace and we pray and we ask that you would um, help us understand how we can help, how we can support what we can do here on on this side of the world. Lord, we, um, we are so grateful for your love. We are so grateful that you uh, care for those who are hurting. We just, um, yeah, we pray that, uh, that you would lead us uh, towards helping those uh, who need it most. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Mark. I'm here with Chris Mutu, who has been a part of the the Meeting House and a part of Home Church for a number of years. I know Chris has been a part of larger home churches, has had kids, and wanted um, to change that, be a part of a different experiences for for his whole family. Chris is now a part of a home church with two other families, and they have had a wide variety of experiences. Chris, I'm so thankful that you are here and able to share a bit more about your story um, with us all today. Thank you for that. Thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah. So, Chris, what is um, what are some of the the impacts, some of the benefits, some of the results that you're seeing as being a part of this home church? 
Yeah, um, the, the, definitely the benefits that we've seen, um, they, they came out right away. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of times we're, we're sharing, um, you know, big issues that are coming up in our lives. Um, you know, being part of that sort of sandwich generation, taking care of parents as well mm-hmm. as taking care of kids. You know, it's it, it's tough uh, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's big issues and they're bombarding you from both sides. And it's really great that we can have that time together in a small group. And we can really just sort of spit it all out and just get it all out out, out in the open. And um, the, because of the smaller group, we've got that straight intimacy that we can share a lot of things that are going on in our lives. And um, it's 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 been amazing, something that we didn't really know was going to come out of it. But, you know, throughout the week, we actually track with each other to see, you know, like, how did you do on that appointment? How did you do on that interview? How did things go uh, from from one thing to the next? And, and then when we come back mm-hmm. the next week, we try to our best to meet every single week. And um, and we can now track about what's going on with 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 that. And you know, we all have girls, and we're all raising them. And and you know, they're all they've ranged in different ages. And and you know, we can rally around each other. And uh, and uh, you know, if if one parent is dealing with something, uh, you know, as as a child gets older, you know, puberty and so on and so forth, we can all hmm. sort of rally around and, and give our own input on how we should we should uh, address those things and we work together as a sort of a united front uh, on try to uh, helping out that parent or both all of our parents all together um, mm. with uh, sort of managing those things. I love that. So often in society today, we feel like we need to be able to do it alone, right? And this feels so counterculture to that. You are joining together intentionally and supporting each other and helping each other out. That's right, yeah. That's yeah, the yeah. village basically you kind of created, right? It takes a village. That's so beautiful. Hey, to all of you watching today, if you are thinking about joining a home church, perhaps you've considered it, um, hear this as your time to do this. Go join a home church. It can be life transformational, as you've heard from Chris here. Thanks for uh, sharing today, Chris. It's been good to be together. Thanks a lot, Mark. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Chris Mutu. As you can see, I might just have a favorite shirt that I like to wear um, on (laughs) these conversations. Um, But really, I love that story that Chris is sharing, that idea of doing life together, that idea of it takes a village. And really, that's what home church is about. That is the beauty of home church, this coming together and doing life together. Um, with one another. Here at the Meeting House, uh, we talk a lot about discipleship and the phrases of uh, trust, grow, give, go together. And home church is that perfect image of doing life and growing in discipleship together. It's that perfect opportunity. Uh, But as we think about discipleship and how we grow as disciples of Jesus, we also recognize that give is a big part of that. And so I just want to, um, I just want to mention if you are interested in giving to the meeting house, if you are interested in partnering with what God is doing in and through um, the people here and the communities and the churches at the meeting house, I want to invite you to go to the meetinghouse.com slash give uh, for more information about how you can um, financially give to the meeting house and what God is doing. Okay, I am going to pray, and then we are going to uh, wrap up our uh, series with Jimmy today. So excited. I have loved this um, series that we're in. And as a bonus, afterwards, um, there's going to be an after party today. And you'll hear more about that uh, after the service. I'll let you know some of the details for the after party. But will you pray with me, and then we'll throw it to musical worship and teaching. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that your love is the most real thing in our lives today. I just pray that um, you could open our hearts and our spirits to your love, to what you are doing in our lives, that you could bring people into our lives that will uh, reveal you to us in new and deeper ways. Thank you, Jesus, that you are active, that you are at work in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. It certainly feels like a privilege that we can gather together, and um, it is a privilege to come before God. We can be united in our words in of worship of Him. So um, we're going to invite you to please join in as we sing our words of love to God this morning.
Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. There's a 
I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. So I'm
wanna know you I'm laying down all my religion I'm laying down I wanna know you Maybe we missed it. What God showed us when he first introduced himself, that he will crawl into the dirt to be near us, and that he will fill our lungs with air when we don't know how to breathe. Nightbird. Only in the presence of God shall we find power to make progress. Layla Gifty Akita. Jesus accomplishes the reality of our reconciliation with God not its possibility. Karl Barth. All I want is peace and love on this planet. Ain't that how God planned it? Chuck D. I conceive of God, in fact, as a means of liberation and not a means to control others. If the concept of God has any validity or use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. James Baldwin. And whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul. Oh man, so good. Welcome friends to part four of our series, Eyes and Hearts and Minds, where we've been walking through the book of Colossians and leaning into what Paul has to teach us about the centricity, the focus of Jesus as the author and perfecter in our faith, but then also how we engage uh, our senses, that, that the way we experience the life of Christ, the way that we experience the depth of our faith is not just through eyes forward monologue or just through reading, but it's actually like the whole earth is saturated with the presence of God. And this has been a fantastic series, don't you think? Don't you think? Yes. Oh. So in case you're just joining us for the first time and you're like, what is all this excitement about at the Meeting House? Um, uh, it, would, it would serve you well to go back and uh, check out the previous um, three sermons and all of the art that's entailed. I'll give you a quick overview here. Part one, we talked about how Colossians provides a radical shift in our view of empire and power. And then part two, we talked about how Jesus reveals the mystery of God, which is, ta-da, love. Part three, how do we pray for each other? How do we think through and be conscious of uh, each other as brothers and sisters in community? And then today, what do we really think and feel about it all? What do we really think and feel about it all? Now, it's fascinating. The book of Colossians, um, you know, if you are new to faith, or maybe this is your first time checking out a church, or maybe you're watching online and you're investigating the claims of Jesus, and why would you choose Jesus in and amongst all the other things that you could choose or not choose, uh, Colossians speaks so specifically into that. Now, Colossians is a circular letter. Now, what that means is you have the Apostle Paul, who is essentially a missionary. He, he's uh, born out of Judaism into this new way of faith with Jesus as Messiah, the Anointed One, and he starts getting the gospel out. And so it's fascinating when we read that there's a letter sent to the city of Coloss, Colossae, or the church in Colossae, this is a long way from home. This is about 900 miles or so from like the center point of faith, which is Jerusalem. So the gospel has gone out far and wide. And so Paul is writing these letters to these small, newly founded churches saying, keep going, 
keep going. Yes, life is hard, but you know, in, in this world you'll have troubles, but, but Jesus has overcome the world. There's something better at work despite our difficulties, despite our stresses. And so as you walk through the book of Colossians, chapter 1, chapter 2, and then even into chapter 4, chapter 3 is like this strange left turn. So all through the book, uh, we see that Paul is like diving into deep theology. In chapter 1, he writes a hymn, which wouldn't have been foreign to the culture at the time. The Caesars had hymns written for themselves all the time. The gods had hymns written for themselves all the time. And in chapter 1, Paul dives deep into like, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Do you want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Remember, repeat his teaching. This is who God really is. And then in chapter two, he goes into the practical of like, here's how we think about this in light of everything else that we're experiencing and how we support each other. In chapter four, he wraps up as like, okay, this is what right thinking, right, uh, right thinking uh, looks like. And then in chapter three, he goes all into the hearts and feels. Chapter three goes all into like, how do we think about this? How do we respond? How does this change the way that we act? He asks the question, how do we feel? What do we think and how do we act? How do we feel, what do we think, and how do we act? We see that Paul, strangely, in chapter 3, engages the senses. We don't see that very much in the previous chapters, or even in chapter 4, but in chapter 3, Paul is leaning into the experiential sense of God, of the experience of the love of God that captures our imaginations, our eyes, and our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our hearts and our minds, which is the, the title, the, the description of this series, engaging, knowing that God saturates our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And he references a few specific things, one of which is music. Now, I've been a mus- musician for uh, many, many years. I'm, I'm a, you know, admittedly, I'm a, I'm a Bible nerd as well, but music, for me, has that ability to, like, snap me back to, like, oh, I remember when I heard that song. I remember the first time on a radio or the first time I clicked on it on iTunes or I remember the first time I saw a video or I remember the first time I was at that show or I remember I heard the, the first time I heard like that pedal with that guitar, it just like snaps me back to that moment. I can even remember like, oh, I remember what I was wearing and when I had more hair. Uh, and music does that. I've heard it said, and probably you have too, that music is the language of the soul, that art is the fingerprint of the divine that continues to speak to the world. And so, my brothers and sisters, we are going to play everybody's favorite game, quick karaoke with Jimmy. You ready? You ready? Okay, let's do it. All right, so here's how this is going to work. Uh, And by the way, like if you're watching online, just drop if you can, I'm going to play a couple quick riffs and then you're going to guess the song, okay? Now we have prizes available. Ushers will be coming through the aisle, and by prizes, I mean uh, nothing, okay? Okay, so here's the first one. Don't be shy. Yell it out, okay? Ready? Here's the first one. hey today is going to... Okay, I can't sing the whole thing so we don't get shut down on YouTube. All right, how about this one? Yeah, La Bamba, okay, okay, how about, okay, Super Bowl, how many of you watched the Super Bowl? Anybody? Still Dre, still Dre, still Dre. Okay, let's go back to the 1800s, how about this one? Old school hymn that when I grew up in the church, I absolutely hated. Anybody? Holy, holy, holy. Very good. All right, what's another obscure one? Okay, how about this? How about this? Okay. So this, I'm a 90s kid, so if you know this one, we are going to be friends. Oh my goodness, yes. Today, Smashing Pumpkins. Very good. All right, you all win. We're all winners in the kingdom of God. Very good. Very good. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Now, that song in particular takes me back because that was like uh, one of my go-to um, albums. So Siamese Dream, Smashing Pumpkins, the like record hit was, uh, was Today. And the, the, the lyrics are very simple, but like really captured me. Today is the greatest day I've ever known. It was fascinating. What that snaps me back to when I play even that quick riff is, is 
not the lyrics of the song. It's not the first time that I heard it when I was, uh, you know, kind of in Ottawa. But instead, it was a trip that I was invited to be on with another pastor colleague of mine uh, in Serbia. And so this was the, ver- the ver- early part of the 2000s. And so if you remember the conflict of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Serb war that happened throughout the 90s. And then by the early 2000s, it was kind of uh, resolved in part that there was still so much animosity and it was a war-torn place. I had never seen that before. I'd traveled all over the world before, but this was the first time that I'd ever seen that level of poverty, destruction, and grief. And so we, we flew into Germany, and then we bounced over to Budapest, and then we went south into Serbia. And I remember driving through, just with my Canadian sensibilities, not having experienced this before, asking our host, like, are we safe? Like, I'm seeing buildings that are still like, laid waste that are, that's rubble. And he was like, oh, yeah, this is how things are. And as we drove and drove and drove, and it was about a six-hour trip uh, to Nova Sad in Serbia where we were, it just got worse and worse and worse. And so we got to his home, uh, and his home was a very simple home, and that like wonderful sense of uh, Eastern European hospitality. He just wanted to give us everything that he had, even though we had so much already. And we just sat down, and we're like, is this what it's like? Like, is this what your world is like, and what do we have to offer except prayer, a solitude, unity, and just like being together? And he was like, yeah, but this is what it's like. You know, we don't have any cable services. Um, you know, the government is largely corrupt. We don't have any police services. You'll likely be threatened to be kidnapped if you go anywhere outside of the house. I was like, oh, that's a fun fact. But yeah, this is how, we, how it is. But do you know what, Jimmy? God is good. Jesus is here. We're doing what we need to be doing together. Yeah, and I remember thinking, but is it though? Like, look at what we've experienced. Look at what you've experienced here. And so one morning I got up early and uh, I just needed to get outside. And so I popped in my headphones, went for a run and uh, threw on like that song today by Smashing Pumpkins, went for a run. And like, there's no real, it was a pretty small village outside of Nova Sad that we were staying in. And so I was running around, did a small kind of like lap of what seemed familiar, came back. And as I got back to um, the home that we were staying in, Danny, our host, was like, kind of like ran out to greet me. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I just went for a run. He's like, you can't do that here. People don't know you, don't trust you, and you could get kidnapped. We might need to leave. And so in one moment, the meaning of that song, the memory, the core memory of that song changed in an instant. Today is the greatest day I've ever known. Is it? Like, I'm here to serve, I'm here to encourage a church, and everything is in rubble. War, empire, power, that seems like what's in charge. I remember myself think, like, thinking to myself, God, are, are you seeing this? Maybe that's how you're feeling, maybe that's collectively how we are feeling today. In light of everything that's gone on in the last uh, little while, certainly for our church, but also the news of the invasion of Ukraine, like uh, Mike so wonderfully led us through this morning. Maybe we're asking those same things. God, what is going on? Is this how we were meant to live? Like, what does the church, the body of Christ, the emblem, the image of Christ in the world have to say, will anything ever change? God, are you seeing this? Now, it's fascinating. This would have absolutely been the background of the writing of the book of Colossians. Absolutely. There's divine correlations for us now that the the illumination of Scripture still is true in our hearts and minds. Paul was writing to a little church and a little city that had been through a whole lot, to a community of people, a community of faith, a young community of faith that was going through empire, evil, war, conflict, chaos, and a church that was feeling uh, stressed and in confusion. Now, we're going to be, like I said, in chapter 3 of Colossians, so I'll invite you to take out your Bibles. Uh, There's some visitor Bibles at the back. I think we can flag ushers down if you need one. Otherwise, you can just head up uh, and go grab one. But uh, turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, or if you want to take out your phone, feel free to do that. If you're watching online, if you want to click over to another window and open Bible Gateway or Bible Hub and follow along, we're going to walk through a good chunk of it, and it is a good chunk indeed. While you're finding your spot there in Colossians chapter 3, I'll remind you just of a couple of things. One is just to reiterate 
reiterate what Mike said is uh, that our Road to Hope series, uh, walking through the Lenten season and these rhythms of faith and practice leading up to Good Friday and Easter starts next week, next Sunday, right here and online. And then also today, uh, though we're wrapping up our series in Colossians, we also have the after party. And so make sure that you're tuning in online at meetinghouse.com slash live today at 12 Eastern time. And also we've gotten some great questions in already. There is still time. There's still time to send in questions. And so if, uh, if there's anything that you want to revisit from the sermon today or the last uh, number of weeks, you can email those questions to ask at the meeting house.com, ask at the meeting house.com, and it always proves to be such a great conversation together. All right, you've got Colossians 3 open there. So when I talk about trading spaces, trading spaces. So this is how Paul, uh, we'll start in verse uh, 11. So I'll throw it up on the screen here as well. Therefore, actually, let me just read the verse before. Um, Paul starts out saying, here, there is no here in this community, in this life of faith, in this way we understand a connection with God and the image of the invisible in Jesus, the centricity of Jesus. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, bear with one another, and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance or even something against anybody else, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. And then he goes on to say, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How is that for a section of Scripture? My goodness. So Paul is writing to a church that has been impacted, oppressed, split apart by a number of different factors. And so instead of like the presence of God, the location of God being in Jerusalem, the holy city, Paul continues through his letters to, and and as did Jesus, say the gospel is going out, you will do greater things even than I. And so the gospel has gone out to, to the far reaches of the known ancient Near East at the time. But not on its own. So this small church uh, in and around, um, you know, the city of Colossus and, and, and Ephesus were in the Lycus Valley um, near Macedonia, like, you know, northwest of Jerusalem, a long, long way. And Paul is writing into a specific context for a specific time period, and these words are not just arbitrary. Now, it's fascinating at the time. Uh, this was the first time in sort, uh, in sort of Roman religious history where the imperial cult, the way of Rome, which we mentioned in week two, had started to call its Caesars divine beings, had started to call its emperors the people in charge. Not only are they in charge, not only are they kings and rulers, but they are like divine sons, the ones who who make their dwelling on planet Earth. And the Caesars had songs written about themselves, two Caesars in particular. Um, We don't know which uh, Caesar it's attributed to, but wrote a song like this, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth proclaim his glory. Where have we heard that before? And so not only that, not only was it divine worship of the Caesars and of the imperial cult, but also the sense of like Jewish mysticism and Gnosticism like Danielle uh, mentioned. And not only that, but there was also a sense of like, well, actually there's religious ob- uh, obligation for where you came from. Like you were born out of Judaism through, mo- uh, through monotheism. Like God, Yahweh is God the Father, the only true God. And so if you're getting this right, which you have to, you follow Torah, you follow law, and you bear the divine mark, which is circumcision. If you're not circumcised, you're not following Torah you're not getting it right. And then a couple other Near Eastern philosophies that were seeping in. And so imagine as a church, you have all of this external pressure coming internal on the church. 
And so some scholars would say there was a heresy, there was like one mode that was attacking this young church. I would contend that there, it likely wasn't a singular heresy, but it was the heresy of like, just try everything and hope you get it right. Like throw it at the wall and whatever sticks, you did your best. And so now think about this. When Paul writes into this context in verse 11, what is the first thing that he says? Here, there, we're all united. We're all united in Christ. Here, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no chosen and unchosen. There is no barbarian, and the Greeks believe that anybody who is not Greek was a barbarian. There is no circumcised or uncircumcised. The mark of God, it doesn't matter. It's the mark of God that's on your heart. There's no Scythian. The Scythians were like the lowest of the low, worse than Samaritan. They called them dogs, like the worst people of the worst. There's no male or female, he goes on to say. There's no slave or free. Christ is all. Christ is all and in all. Now, this might seem to our Western ears like a very like social justice-y um, statement. Or not. We would probably nod along and be like, yeah, of course, that's all. Yeah, all sounds good. All sounds good. In that context, this is something, saying something radically different. This is subverting empire. This is subverting all of these contending factors that tend to pull people apart. And Paul says, no, 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 no. We start with equality. No, 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 we start together. And what unifies us together? Christ is all and Christ is in all. He starts by leveling the playing field by saying, I mean, you've heard it said that the, that the Caesars are God. Nope. Christ is all, all that matters. Everyone has a place. Everyone has a place. There's room for everyone in this kingdom. And he goes on to say, okay, so if everybody is equal then, how should, in this community of faith, if there's no status symbols, no hierarchy of the gods, if we're not looking to please the multitude of the gods or the one warring God that seems to be in charge of the known world, how should things be ordered in Christ? And then in 12 to 14, he goes on to say, just like this, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. What do our weapons look like? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. When we're tempted to bear arms, when we're tempted to espouse religious violence, when we're tempted to like status ourselves above anybody else, what is the reminder that Jesus is all and is in all and our weapons, our language, the way that we order ourselves in community, the way that the church should look, the way that Jesus' image, the image of the invisible made visible now, the way that we should look is, reflect, is by reflecting Jesus in our compassion, our kindness, our humility, our gentleness, our patience, the way that we forgive and bear with one another no matter the cost, and that all of these things are bound together in love. This is a legitimate trading of space. Imagine hearing this for the first time as a Jew who's, you know, understanding this new way of, like, loving, peaceful, other-centered empire, that indeed the spaces have changed. God is not in temple. God is not with Caesar and Rome on the throne, but God is here. God is here. And what do the, temple, do the temples look like? What did Jesus say? You, us, you are the living temple. You're walking around, you know, gangly, tall, short, fat, long hair, short hair, balding hair, body, temple of God, temple of God. You bear the image of the divine through compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. If you ever need a gut check of like, how am I doing? Put that transparency over yourself. And then trading places. So what does real power feel like in the economy of Jesus? Verse 15. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, encourage one another with all wisdom through what? Psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. 
One more time. Let the message of Christ, what you've learned, what's been taught, what's been experienced, don't just let it be head knowledge, but that it saturates your soul to the point that it dwells in you richly as you teach, as you remind, as you tell the story over and over, and then as you encourage. And how do we encourage well in this community of faith? With wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, speaking to God, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, Whatever you do, whatever you find yourself putting your hands to, whatever you do, do it all in in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father, through him. Now, it's fascinating. If you were to take, like, a bus tour uh, through the ancient Near East, even now, um, there is no shortage of temple construct, of monuments, of statues. And so, for the gods at the time, there was the pantheon of gods, almost like a, a limitless amount of gods that people worshipped, and worshipped by and large out of pressure. And so even in modern archaeology, we're finding that like they're uncovering, even in these old ancient homes, little like figurine deities that people would have in their homes just to make sure that they got it right. Well, we have this God in our home, so, so our, our sense of uh, procreation will be blessed. Oh, we have this God, this emblem in our home, so our, our fields, our, our land will, will be blessed and multiply. We have these gods in our home, so we'll be healthy and whole. We have these gods in our home, so if we try and conquer and go to war, we will win. And then even further than that, with the Caesars, the, the Caesars built temples, built churches for themselves. The Caesars wrote hymns, like I said, for themselves. The Caesars wrote epics, books about themselves to show that they were the divine presence on planet Earth. The Caesars built monuments, huge statues to themselves. One Caesar in particular called Domitian had a giant statue of himself built on a coastal city with a fist and a scroll in the air. And he said to people, worthy is Caesar who is, who is worthy to open the scroll and tell people how to live. Where We heard that before. Caesars, the people in charge, the gods seemed to build themselves stuff. The the Caesars, the Roman Empire took, took and spread out, amassed land, conquest, built armies, built weapons. And what did the earliest church do? What did they say to each other? Let's not take stuff, let's make stuff. Like, should we be the same as the powers at play right now? Should we be fighting and amassing land, just trying to take over and and get our God in power? Or should we exemplify the love of God in Jesus Christ that creates, that writes, that sings? And this is what Paul is getting to here. So instead of just having it be head knowledge of just like learning and memorizing, which has its place, like sing, write psalms, remind each other, encourage each other, admonish admonish each other, Go through the Psalms, these like this ancient book of poetry. Make stuff, don't take stuff. Create, don't obliterate. Isn't that amazing? This is what the earliest church was known for. It was not known for, what do the earliest church folks do? Well, they meet Sunday morning in a building and they go home or go to Swiss Chalet or Kelsey's or something like that. Instead, it was a lifestyle. It was embedded in every facet of their lives. They knew and were convinced that every time that they put their hands to something, the entire world was saturated with the divine in Jesus. That every emblem, a chair, a poem, a guitar, a song, a hymn, was because Jesus is not somewhere else, but is here now with us. Christians don't take, we make Christians don't take, we make. Christians do not move out into the world to conquer, but move out into the world to care. The earliest Christians were known as helpers, caregivers, artists, creators. And they did so knowing that God, the creator, was there with them. His presence was around them, that all creation points to the divine. And so what does that feel like here in community? What, what kind of admonishment or encouragement or maybe even a rebuke to the Christian church today, what does that mean for us today? What does the presence of God and art and creation and making and not taking look like? Well, presence. Being reminded that the, the fingerprint of God is everywhere. 
The fingerprint of God is everywhere. The language of God is speaking to our souls even now. Presence, hearness, sensing the connection of God in and through the body of Christ. What right now is the visible image of the invisible God? The body of Christ, the church. When people need to know what God looks like, they should see it in us. The living temples walking around, making our dwelling here and now, not conquering but caring, not hindering but helping. Amazing, amazing. This is the encouragement to the early church. The church is always at its best when we're making, creating, innovating, and communicating the love of Jesus to the world. Paul says to encourage each other with these things, to encourage each other with the power of presence of Jesus here with us, engaging our senses, reminding us that Caesar is not Lord, that government is not Lord, that money is not Lord, that war and politics and power is not Lord, but that Jesus is. The whole thing points to Jesus who is love, who is peace, and who is here, who is here, not anywhere else living in and among us, changing the world in an unstoppable force of good. That's what the church is. That's what our gathering should look like. Now, like I said, the Caesars had songs written to themselves. And this is like, if you go back to to chapter uh, one of Colossians, it's fascinating that starting in verse 15, Paul does something that you don't actually see in many, if any, of his other letters. He writes a song. He writes the Jesus hymn. And this isn't Paul being like, oh, I had a nice glass of herbal tea. I'm feeling creative. Sit down on my mat and write something out. He's being like, this is an actual affront to the power of empire at the time. This is Paul sitting down, the church stewarding the song of being like, you think your dude Caesar is Lord? Maybe here and now, but this is bigger than just our living life here. Your dude will die, our dude doesn't. So they started to write these songs, these hymns, these like uh, reminders, these poems to, to remind uh, each other that although Caesars had hymns written to themselves, although poems, they had poems written about themselves, although they had art created for themselves, they had buildings built for themselves, the Christian job is to always subvert those things. Passivism is bringing peace, not P-A-S-S, but P-A-C, bringing peace through justice, subversion, care, other-centeredness, including more people, not excluding. So the early church subverted these songs, subverted these pieces of art, and pointed to, to the real king, the ruler, the good news that Jesus has always been about confronting the false claims of imperial religion and power and replacing it with love. Rule one. Clothe yourselves and all these things put on love with, which binds us together in perfect unity. And then while you're at it, be people of justice, of gentleness, other-centeredness, peace. For Paul and Colossians, the prevailing powers of syncretism, of the pantheon of gods, of confusion, of the power of Rome, empire, heresy, were not the center of the story. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Jesus is. Jesus is the consummate reminder of what God looks and feels, thinks and sounds like in the church. And the church should look and feel and think and sound the same to the world. It's invitation in, not excluding out. It's a, it's a community of faith that helps and not hinders. It's a community of faith that, that, that cares, that doesn't conquer. It's a community of faith that creates, that makes and doesn't take. So at the end of our time in Serbia, um, I found myself just so down. I would love to say, oh, God taught me so much. I would say that was probably one of the most doubtful, um, painful experience that I'd ever had in my life, just being awakened to human suffering that is in most of the rest of the world. And so at the end of our trip, after we toured around and kind of helped some agencies there, um, we, we, we were part of a church service. And this church service was like a fascinating one. Like it was not this. And so we were all on benches. It was to, I, I'm out of time, but I'll tell you a quick story. I mean, um, we had an offering like, like we do here. And I was like, okay, this is familiar. We've got an offering. And people brought animals. <laughs> yeah. so this is one lady who brought like by the legs two chickens. And I was like, what do we do with those? And our host was like, we eat them. Like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But I remember sitting like hearing a sermon, 
reading through scripture, and then we were about to close with a song, and I just remember thinking, like, how do these people do it? Like, I am so down and depressed. Like, God, what is the reminder of faith that you're doing here? How are you encouraging these people? And then the son of the host uh, that we were there with, he went on stage, picked up a little classical guitar, and told his own story about how, despite their present suffering, God has always been at work. And I remember kind of listening for a bit and being like, yeah, I don't know about that. That seems, that seems tough. And he started to play this song. a beautiful rendition. Thank you, Jimmy, for sharing uh, with us today. I love that um, as he's talking about that line of Christians don't take, we make, right? We bring peace. We, we offer something. We don't take. I just think there's so much in that for us this week. So I pray that you have a week filled, filled with peace, that you, are, that you know that you are loved, and that you're able to um, experience that love and show others the love of Jesus as well. We'll see you at noon for the after party. Um, thanks for hanging out today. We'll see you next time. Take care.